as a nation, how do we get to a point where we all feel safe? This country was founded on violence. We have to acknowledge that. It, it was founded on violence. Violence is in its DNA. Guns are part of this country's DNA, unfortunately. And while you have those who think that by having more guns will make us safe, there's this perception of safety that I think if we could ever get together and actually, and, and this is the call to, to people of faith, we're supposed to be different. And so if we could get people of faith together to figure out how, how do we do this? How do we really make our community safe, knowing that there's, there are those like me who say, I'm not gonna carry a gun. I could legally carry a gun. I could preach with a gun in a pulpit, which I just think, I, I don't think Jesus would um, carry a gun. Um, in fact, I know Jesus would not carry a gun. But what is the difference between people who say, I feel safe, I feel safe. Even when I see the world around me going crazy, I feel safe and I'm not going to arm myself, as opposed to those who say, no, I see the world going crazy around me and I need to be prepared just in case something happens. So it's really coming together and sitting down and figuring out how can we be safe in our communities? And if people are willing to give up some rights in order to be secure in other rights. How did policing develop in this country? We have to go back to the beginning of policing in America. And if we look at police departments in the South, they came directly out of the slave patrols of the South. And so those slave patrols were at first to control the comings and goings of slaves. They morphed into uh, controlling the comings and goings of free blacks. And once blacks were freed in this country, you still needed some way to know where they were and so the slave patrols morphed into police departments in the South. In the North, a lot of the police departments came out of the desire of the industrialists to protect their interests. And so uh, when you had strikes or you had companies that were trying to unionize, then the industrialists would bring in police forces that weren't formerly police forces to break the strikes, to to shut down the desire for unionization. And so then these were formalized. But the, the problem is that when recruit officers are in the academy, they get this kind of history that is not complete of policing, that we had watches and wards, and you had people who were doing citizen patrols. And because they didn't want to do that, they weren't getting paid, then we needed a different system. And so we borrowed from the Metropolitan Police Department uh, in London, England with Sir Robert Peel. And so it sounds really nice and an easy flow, but we leave out the part that deals with the underside, the underbelly of policing and how policing is really to maintain um, the values of those who are able to get their values and their desires codified in the law. And so you have a situation where, from the beginning, policing has been an us versus them. And the them have been people of color, uh, Native Americans, immigrants, anybody who was not in the mainstream of power in this country. Is the Black Lives Matter movement misunderstood? Unfortunately, in this country, especially with the killing of black and brown brothers and sisters, and now the murders, killings of police officers, if I lift up the police officers, it is perceived that I must put down the killing of black and brown bodies. If I lift up the black and brown bodies, it is perceived as putting down the police officer's loss of life, as opposed to, it's both and. It's not either or, it's both and. But people don't want to hear both and, that both sides, all lives, are really important. 
However, at certain points, we recognize that black and brown bodies were not taken, consider, uh, taken into consideration. They were, they were not valued. But if we could actually get everybody on the same level, they say a rising tide raises all boats. That's where we have to get to with this conversation. And it's not a put down if I say, oh, well, we need to pray for the police officers. And folks say, well, if you're praying for the police officers, you're negating what is happening to black and brown bodies. No, it's just that right now, the issue is the killing of police officers. And so we are not choosing sides. We're saying that they are all important and no one, no one should be killed. What are your thoughts on reconciliation? I have come to the opinion that we cannot have racial reconciliation. If we just look at the definition of reconciliation is to put back together something that was once whole. And the question I ask people is when have the so-called races in this country ever been one? When have we ever been together as the American people, if you want to use that term. And so before we can talk about reconciling, we have to figure out how do we get together as, as one people? And that question kind of eludes these, these discussions. How do we become one people? And whether or not we really want to become one people, what will happen if we actually become one people? What would that look like? Would we still have um, one class of people who are perceived to be better than another? And I don't think people want to deal with those really tough, tough questions and issues. What would we have to give up in order to become one people? And so racial reconciliation, I think, is down the road. First, we have to be reconciled, if that's a word, as one people and do the hard work of figuring out what does that really look like? Where is the church in all of this? Again, I think for people of faith, it's, it's kind of up to us uh, to call together talking groups where people feel safe to speak about their experiences without judgment, without critique. It's almost like therapeutic. Let me just tell you how it is. And then people can respond by saying, I think this is what I heard, as opposed to, no, you can't feel that way, or no, that's not how it is. They have to speak from their own experience. And so until we get to the point where we can speak from our own experiences together at local levels, I don't think we can ever do it as a nation. We've had national conversations on race, televised, right? Where do we go from there? What happened because of those national conversations? And so it's going to have to be on an individual basis. Jesus dealt with individuals. And that's what we're going to have to do. We have to deal with individuals. And uh, I think the church is a safe place for many people to have those conversations. <laughs>